So good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our 62nd webinar, uh, weekly webinar. Uh, last time we discussed about the various regulations uh, around valuation under IBC. And uh, this time we are looking at all the recent judgments with respect to valuation under IBC as well as IBBA orders to insolvency professionals with respect to valuation related matters. Over to Anil, sir. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, good morning. Namaste to all the participants. Uh, the, the last time what we enjoyed the most was the number of questions, which in fact we couldn't answer, but we will in fact try to answer today in case those questions are asked today. Focus today would be all the judgments where the valuation by a registered valuer is an issue. Also, the IBBI orders where the issue is registered valuers or valuation. Some of the orders against the registered valuers are also covered. And in the later part, in case we could get some time today, however, we see we will give preference to the questions and answers. However, in case we could get some time today, then Ankit will take us through to the new proposed international standard, which is likely to be implemented. So let me share my screen, Ankit. I'll quickly take you uh, take take all through this uh, judgments. Okay, good. Uh, so, okay, we can now start with the uh, one judgment, which is from NCLT Kolkata, and it is in the case of EMC Limited, and we've also process consultants in this case. Anand T, which is the RP for EMC, and this is a case where the resolution plan was first approved. I think there was a uh, network issue. Maybe you can try presenting again. The, web, the, the presentation was not visible to me at least. Now it is. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I, I'll start again. So the, the first judgment that we are going to cover, it is a judgment in the case of EMC Limited. This company is a, in, a EPC company and the RP is Kanan T. And in this case, the first resolution plan was approved and however, it was not implemented. And after the adjudicating authority approved that a fresh expression of interest be invited in this case. Then the committee of creditors insisted that the RP should get a valuation a fresh valuation done because the, the first process was conducted in uh, in in April 2018, and then uh, then then the then this it, it was second was in 2022. So therefore, the committee of creditors thought that the fresh valuation be conducted. However, the RP was not confident whether there is any regulation or any section which authorizes the RP to go for a fresh valuation. So this was the issue before the adjudicating authority, whether revaluation, fresh valuation can be done by the corporate debtor to determine the fair value or even the liquidation value, because this was a case of uh, uh, resolution process, not liquidation. Now, the NCLT bench decided that we could not find any provision in the code for revaluation, much less if a plan has already been received and its value was not known to the committee, as the same would infringe on the commercial wisdom of the committee of creditors and can be regarded as a kind of change of frame of reference without changing anything on the ground situation. So primarily slightly different uh, facts, hence the adjudicating authority 
cannot at this stage uh, could have directed for a fresh valuation of the assets of the copyright. The application hence was disposed of and rejected. See, this was the case where the fresh valuation was not allowed even after four years. However, in case we see, there is an older judgment and that judgment is in the case of GB Global Limited. And this was a judgment by NCL 80 dated 20th of September 21 in the case of Indian Bank versus Charu Desai erstwhile RP or the chairman of the monitoring committee. So in this case also, the first CIRP was initiated and then uh, the, uh, the, the resolution plan was uh, not implemented, the management and the control was also given to the uh, uh, successful resolution applicants. And then later on, after several months, uh, it, the, even the, everything was given back to the RP. Everything was given back to the RP because the resolution plan was not uh, implemented. Now, the fresh uh, invitation was approved by the adjudicating authority. And therefore, the COC, the, see, since the fresh uh, in expression of uh, interest was allowed by the authority, uh, the COC resolved to obtain valuation of the corporate data and in view of the same, the RP obtained a fresh valuation report. Now, again, a resolution plan was approved. So in this case, the one of the dissenting creditors like Indian Bank, in fact, questioned uh, the valuation as the valuation was not suitable to the dissenting financial creditors. So they questioned the valuation and the authority of the RP to go for revaluation. So this was the finally appeal. And in this appeal, the appellate authority, NCL 80, they actually dealt with an issue whether the decision of the COCO to obtain a more recent valuation report and realistic valuation report is contrary to the provisions of the code and regulations framed therein. In this case, the appellate tribunal decided that the earlier resolution plan was approved it was failed. The lapse of time is uh, substantial. And NCLAT is of the view that COC decision to obtain a fresh valuation could not be considered as any contravention to any provisions of the IBC or its rules related and regulation. NCLAT further stated that although under the CIRP regulation, no power has been given to COC to call for any valuation of fair value or liquidation value, there is also no bar under the IPC provision for the COC to call for fresh valuation report. So when we say this, when we say this, so we have two judgments now. One is the judgment from NCLT Kolkata, which says that there is no provision that for resolution purposes, a fresh valuation can be obtained, even if there is a gap of four years in the two processes. However, there are some different facts. In case we see some different facts and some different observations, and those are also significant, those observations are also significant, and th those observations are the, in this particular case, a resolution plan has already been received and its value was not known to the COC as the same would be an infringement on the commercial wisdom of the committee and can be regarded only as a change of frame of reference without changing anything on the ground reality. So what I'm trying to say is that the, in this particular case, the adjudicating authority, Kolkata bench, tried to differentiate. And however, the reference of this GB Global Limited was not seen in, in this judgment. So in case we see two step, judgments separately, without referring to this appellate authority judgment. So this judgment says that the COC or the RP doesn't have a power to get a fresh valuation done during the CIRP period, even though four years have lapsed between the two processes. However, the NCLAT has said that if the COC takes a valuation 
and the valuation is done and the COC uh, uh, takes some decisions based on that valuation, there is no bar on this. So this is uh, one uh, uh, decision, uh, uh, Ankit, which actually, uh, rather I thought that this is uh, uh, this has to be presented in this manner. So the next decision that we are trying to say is Amit Ahiro versus Anaga Anasinga Razu. This is the 16th of May 2023 decision and CLAT from Justice Ashok Bhushan and uh, Mr. Barun Mitra. Now, in this case, these, like the CIAP was initiated in 21, and the promoter challenged the CIRP order. The Committee of Creditors passed a regulation, uh, passed a resolution, and the no resolution was no resolution plan was received. The Committee of Creditors then resolved to liquidate the company, and then the liquidation application was also submitted, and the promoter again challenged the liquidation application. Now, the promoter says that the valuation of the company which was obtained by the RP uh, is, is not appropriate. It is on lesser valuation. The properties are actually, properties would be auctioned on a lesser valuation. The resolution professional has obtained two valuation reports and the liquidator again took one report. And that too at the instance of the stakeholders consultation committee. Now, two valuation reports were taken as per regulation 30 of the CIRP regulations. When the liquidator got appointed, liquidator only got one valuation report as per regulation 35 of the liquidation process regulation. Now, the issue in this case was whether the liquidator has abided by the value determined through the regulation 35 of the CIRP and regulation 35 of the liquidation process. Incidentally, this regulation 35 and regulation 35, this is the number of the regulation is common, but one is the regulation 35 of the CIRP regulation and the other is regulation 35 of the liquidation regulation. In this case, two valuations were done under regulation CIRP regulation 35 regulation. One valuation was done as per 35 regulation of liquidation process regulation. Now the NCLAT observed in this case that the valuation was obtained during CIRP and that was exactly as per regulation 35 of the CIRP regulation. Now in this particular case, the liquidator has not taken a decision to go for a fresh valuation. Had the liquidator gone for a fresh look, a valuation decision, the liquidator would have appointed two valuers as per regulation 35 of the liquidator, liquidation process regulation. So one valuation was obtained. However, the NCLAT finally decided that the valuation of this particular company, which would be used during the liquidation process, would remain as the valuation which was conducted during CIRP because that is the only valuation as per the regulation 35. Getting one valuation done during liquidation process regulation, that is not a valuation as per regulation 35 of the liquidation because that was only one regulation, one valuation, that was not two valuation. So this is a unique case. Finally, uh, like the liquidator was permitted to go ahead for the sale of the assets as per the liquidation value determined during the, in, in a valuation process under regulation 35 of the CIRP regulation. Ankit, anything that you would like to observe on this? No, I think uh, uh, it's like, uh, uh, I, I, no, 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 no observations per se. I think it's clear. So, now, the coming, uh, coming down to this Kotak Mahindra Bank uh, Limited versus Resolution Professional of Universal Build Well Private Limited, Again, an appellate authority judgment, NCLAT judgment, 11th of April, 2023, latest. It's not very old. Now, the Kotak Mahindra Bank and the Kotak Mahindra Prime Bank, appellant one, appellant two, in fact, uh, they submitted their claim to the RP in Form C as a financial creditor. 
now the R rp appointed two valuers in this case and the valuation was done in, during the uh, cirp process and the rp shared the valuation reports also now the fresh expression of interest was also asked and the uh, the six resolution applicants came including the home buyers welfare association and finally the home buyers welfare association's resolution plan, plan was approved with 70.44% voting share and the, uh, the the appellant had voted against the so the kotak bank one kotak bank two in fact voted against the resolution plan so they were the dissenting financial creditors they were the financial dissenting financial creditors so both these like kotak bank one and kotak bank two one is a kotak bank kotak mitra bank the other is kotak bank prime so the kotak bank one and kotak bank two they they were aggrieved and they filed objections to the resolution plan now the adjudicating authority while deciding the resolution plan uh, remitted the resolution plan to coc for modification in terms of the specified order now the objections raised by the appellants regarding the nil liquidation value ascribed to the appellant with respect to the project universal business park was rejected hence the appeal has been preferred now the issue in this case is the valuers valued the universal business park as nil kotak bank had the security interest on that part of the property the resolution plan only earmarked 3 crores for the kotak bank that is the basic uh, issue because the security value according to them is much higher the valuation was 3 crore the plan earmarked 3 crores uh, 3 crore the valuation was nil now the issue in this case before the anclet was whether the liquidation value found by the registered valuer can or cannot be allowed to be changed by the committee of creditors now what exactly the situation is the liquidation value is zero according to the registered valuers the committee of creditors offered 3 crores to the kotak bank one kotak bank two both now in this case the observations ankit in fact we've been discussing this number of times uh, uh, whenever we are discussing any valuation for a uh, for a real estate company now in this case one of the very important valuation is this is what i'm reading now entire super area of the project was conveyed by sale deeds and by builder buyer agreements the valuer did not enter into issue of encumbrances over the assets. Since the units have already been sold, are no longer the assets of the corporate debtor. Hence, the liquidation value of the project is nil. Now, it says, although it says that partly the sale deeds are executed and partly builder buyer agreement was executed. So now these are encumbrances. Now, the word encumbrance is used basically, the, is, it is used for the builder buyer agreement. So in case the builder buyer agreement is an encumbrance on the property, so therefore the value is nil. So the property value is nil. The maximum that you can have, a, you can assign a value to the receivables if there is anything receivable from the LOT. Now in this case, the decision was the liquidation value arrived by the valuer serves an important factor in the entire resolution process and cannot be ignored by in the resolution process. It is true that COC on any valid reason can take a call to ask for any fresh valuation due to any relevant circumstances, but the valuation done by the registered valuers and average of liquidation value taken up by valuers serve these specific purposes and cannot be allowed to be disregarded by the committee of creditors. So this GB global that we have already uh, handled because this is a GB global that we discussed when we were discussing the EMC that was the adjudicating authority. So this is an appellate authority. In this case, the appellate authority has said that even if a fresh valuation is, evaluation is, evaluation is taken during the CIRP, that was a second uh, uh, resolution process. The first process failed. It was not implemented. So in the second process, the fresh valuation was obtained and it was considered as acceptable. Now coming to the IBBI orders, I would uh, ask Ankit to uh, uh, deliberate on this IBBI orders. So I think Ankit, uh, you please let me know. I would uh, keep changing the slides or you can share from your side also. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that will be a better idea. Let me do that. So I, I think I can stop sharing and you can uh, share from your side also. So I hope this is visible to everyone. Yes, it is visible. So let's talk about this first order. This is 2023 order. This is uh, uh, based on a NCLT Bangalore bench uh, order where the name of the corporate debtor is Base Corporation. So what happened in this case is that the and during the CRP process, the RP had already conducted a valuation process and he had conducted rather a valuation process where he had to appoint three valuers because maybe the two valuations were significantly different. And it's a very old case. This is basically 2019 is when the CRP commencement happened. And uh, we, uh, uh, we were also one of the valuers who were engaged in the CRP process in this matter. Uh, then what happened is that the liquidation started and the liquidator was somebody else. The liquidator was not the RP himself. And the liquidator went ahead and appointed uh, some NSFA value to give a feedback or give a consultation on what would be the overall in change in the value of the company uh, in case it is uh, sold as a going concern. So basically, he sought an opinion or he appointed another value to review the subject matter of the previous valuation exercise. So this, uh, based on that review then, uh, the whole concept and the whole process started where the, uh, the insolvency professional conduct in the, the, the whole the process that was uh, discussed in this order is that, was it right to appoint another value first? Number two, was it a point? Was it right to appoint the value of a particular class of asset to understand if there is any change or review the valuation reports of a land and building and a plant and machinery value? So, land and building PM report being reviewed by an SFA value was again a question that came into picture. So, these were the various submissions that were made. And basically, they talked about uh, what were the reasons why it was required, why was a fresh valuation required, and so on. But the final finding was that when uh, the insolvency professional had appointed two registered values already, still appointing another person, uh, they said that the, the, the disciplinary committee said that he should have advice, he should have sought advice of the SEC on the renovation of any professional appointed. And uh, secondly, they, he said that the I order said that um, since there is only narration of independent opinions sought on valuation report and no discussion was done on the fees of Medha Kulkarni, the DC finds the IP in contravention with this these clauses. The whole uh, issue, however, stems from a complaint filed where somebody alleged that the liquidator sold a sold a unit or a sold parcel of the assets of the company at lesser than the valuation that was there. So the allegation was that because the CRP value was higher, perhaps the liquidator went ahead, got another valuation opinion made in the liquidation stage and then sold the assets based on that order. So basically they, 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 they have taken then an action against the uh, IP in this matter. So appointment of values during liquidation process uh, and then understanding what those values are and why they are different from the CRP valuation, I would say, is a takeaway from this order. That even in case you have, uh, you're appointed as a liquidator and you get fresh valuations done from valuation professionals with the SEC uh, consent as well, Still, there needs to be some kind of a linking or some kind of a differentiation between what has been done during the CRP process and what has been done in the liquidation process, the valuation exercise. So I believe, Ankit, one, that if uh, a fresh valuation were to be obtained, then the fresh valuers would have been appointed by the liquidator. Mm -hmm. So there is no provision 
that another valuation consultant be appointed to see whether the earlier valuations were right or wrong and this is the this is the only contravention because the either you take a decision to appoint valuers and second third third is my, the observation is that even the appointment of uh, this consultant was not discussed with the stakeholders yeah i think you can go forward so then this next one is uh, uh, is again coming from 2020 coming in from a crp matter called educom infrastructure and schools limited uh, and school limited so uh, several contraventions were here and uh, they were basically these uh, the two valuers appointed in this matter gave in their value and uh, they subsequently revised their report and decreased the values the original values that they gave they gave the valuation report submitted it it went to the coc after the coc gave all the uh, uh, all the uh, feedback uh, they then revised the reports and gave a different value so in this order although there was no contravention that was observed but the but the but the but the analysis and everything that we read here talks about how this discussion or this question was discussed in this disciplinary order whether the revision happened due to interference by the coc or not so the analysis that they finally arrived at was that uh, that uh, the the ip submission was uh, noted that the valuations were only disclosed by the rp to the coc members after resolution plans had been opened and tabled before the coc members and confidentiality undertaking had been obtained from each of the coc members and therefore there was no contravention in this respect the submission that coc had not interfered with the valuation exercise or the value the coc had queried about the methodology and assumptions which the valuers agreed with and then accordingly revised the report this was an objective and transparent process was also noted so the revision that the values did post coc was not held to be something that was negative but however the ibb in this order noted that I noted a fact that there was no evidence that that has been found corroborating the fact that either RP or COC has interfered with the valuation exercise or the liquidation values could be determined. So the interference was the issue here. So the revision can happen as long as there is a change which is happening due to certain corrections in facts, certain uh, change in the methodology. <coughs> Uh, more appropriate but in case we say that somebody had given a valuation report giving a x value with some discounting to the liquidation value and suddenly after the coc meets him he changes that number and and kind of decreases that number or increases that number so that decrease or increase has to be grounded based on real issues based on some change in the methodology some change in facts and can't be uh, something which is a change in the opinion or that might be understood as a change uh, of uh, 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 as an as an interference <clears throat> so going forward to the next one this one is with respect to appointing the third value and uh, the rp had already appointed two values in this case and uh, it was contended that the same was conducted only pursuant to decision of SEC. So uh, the analysis that IBBI carried on, I think we can uh, skip that. And finally, the order that they passed was that uh, it is the explicit mandate of the code that it is the primary duty of RP to appoint professionals, including valuers, and RP cannot delegate the said process. Then the order that they passed was that the responsibility of the uh, COC and IP are clearly demarcated and in the present scenario the RP despite holding that there is no significant difference between the results of two valuers he, he conceded to the desire of the COC to appoint the third value. I believe this is, a reg this is an order which pertains to prior to the amendment in regulation 35. Present day regulation 35 allows the COC to ask the RP to appoint a third valuer, even if the two valuation reports are not significantly different. 
However, this process is uh, something that may not result into any larger result. Because what happens is that if two valuation reports are not significantly different, they are within 25% ambit. And the third valuation report, let's say, is very, very different, either low or higher than the two valuation reports. Then again, the law and, the, and regulation 35 is clear that for the purpose of computing the liquidation value, you have to look at the closest two values and then take an average of those two values. So despite third value being appointed, the valuation number, the liquidation valuation number, liquidation value number in the whole process might remain the same, even if the third value is appointed. But yes, the third valuer's report can be used as a basis for certain decisions by the uh, COC. Uh, if not, uh, uh, it can always be used that way. So any, any other addition here? So let me move forward. So uh, next we have uh, uh, we 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 have we're looking at this background where the IRP appointed entities, which were not registered value entities, and there was some disclosure related issue, and uh, uh, so the IRP had admitted that he had made a dis made a made a uh, made a mistake, and then that was how. The uh, this case was closed. I think this is an old problem. When the this, I think now we all understand that appointment of valuers can only be registered valuation professionals. Registered valuation professionals can be I R R V S or R V E S. R V E S also read up as registered valuers if you read the law. So therefore, appointment of R V E S registered valuer entities is also permitted in that process. Then uh, we have uh, this next one which talks about appointment of registered valuers. And here the RP had stated that he could not appoint registered valuers as the registered valuers. Uh, he could not appoint the registered values as COC did not approve the cost of registered valuers and wanted uh, incoming RPs to make the appointment. So here, uh, what then happened was that, uh, so the RP was not able to substantiate why he did not appoint the valuation professionals. So we see this as a, uh, if we go to the decision, the decision was that the RP had erred in, uh, in relation to appointment of valuers and the committee held that the provision of the statute was clear that the valuation, the valuer appointment has to happen between the, within the 47th day of the ICD. And uh, it was unclear from the submission why the RP took the issue of appointment of valuers to COC when he himself was competent to take decision in this regard. So further, after taking the approval of the COC, the decision to appoint single value is also not as per the stipulations of the statute. So uh, here again, the whole thought process is that the appointment of the, uh, the, the, maybe the lesson we can take is that an IP must appoint the or start the, initiate the process of appointment of the value sooner, starting maybe from the first COC meeting, I, the IRP. Uh, because in many cases, the IRP is not appointed by 47th day, wherever there is a change in the process. So NCLT would normally not be able to appoint the RP by 47th day uh, because of various reasons. So for so far, the, Ankit, the one is the one that the uh, there can be a possibility of revision in the value. Yes. And uh, the revision in the value should be independent either to the valuers or to the RP. It should not be at the instance of the committee of creditors. This is one. Second is that the... The instance of the RP is also something that the order is against. It says it is only supposed to be because of the valuers' own thought process. The RP and COC both are not allowed to interfere in the valuer's judgment. But as I said, that if there is any fact, if, if there is any methodology that the RP or the COC point out that they are inaccurate or they need to be bettered, then the revision can make more sense. And the second issue is that the, in case you are not able to appoint registered valuers and you are saying that the COC did not approve the fee and the IBBI could not see any document, any evidence that it was rejected by the committee of creditors, that can be that is not acceptable. The RP has to appoint valuers, even if the fee is not approved by the committee of creditors. 
to the valuation with the appointment can be done in that manner that we appoint you. However, your fee will be approved by the committee of creditors uh, in the next meeting. That also is possible. So but conditional appointment later is possible. We get that all the time in AAA valuation. And subsequently, if the COC is not ready to give that kind of a financial sanction, then we also get emails that the COC is uh, finally approving this kind of an expense. Are you okay with this revenue, with this fee? So if, we, if that's okay with us, we say yes. If it is not okay with us, we say no. And in case we say no, then the RP can say that uh, uh, the appointment that happened was at an X fee. And now the RV who was appointed is not accepting the fee that is approved by the COC. And therefore, he can proceed with fresh appointment of valuers. I think these are the three things that we have so far concluded. I think you can go ahead, please. So then uh, this one is uh, talking about uh, uh, this was an inspection done. And uh, the RP proposed uh, a valuer's fee of 1.2 crores before the COC. And the same was ratified by the COC. However, it was noted from the cost disclosure to the IPA that the actual value's fee was 27.48 lakhs. So the question was that why did he approve 1.2 crores when he had only given a fee of 27.48 lakhs? So finally, they, the findings were that uh, although the disclosure was filed in a, uh, in a casual way, or rather the, the ratification happened. But if somebody gets more expense ratified from the COC and ends up spending less, then that's not a problem. That's, that's okay. But there was a huge difference here. 1.2 crores versus 24, uh, 27 lakhs. One fifth uh, was the difference. So, uh, the, so they basically they said that they just gave a warning to the RP and move ahead. This is the next one. Uh, this one is about uh, how uh, uh, they, they understood from the, it has been observed from the appointment letters of the valuers that the RP directed the valuers to conduct valuation of three properties of guarantors along with properties of the corporate debtor. Further, not only were properties of guarantees valued, but the cost for the same was also included in the CIRP cost. So they simply said that you are not supposed to value anything which is not belonging to the corporate debtor. The assets that you're valuing must be belonging to the corporate debtor. This is also a check that we do very thoroughly when we are doing valuations, where we seek some details, some, uh, some uh, documents to ascertain and, and establish that the, the, the ownership of the asset that uh, uh, the valuation is being done for does belong to the corporate debtor. So we do that verification as a valuer as well. So then we go forward and uh, we simply say that uh, we, we look at this one. So uh, the progress report uh, to the AA was not uh, made in time uh, with respect to the various uh, appointment of registered valuers and preparing the IM and all that. So uh, basically, they simply said that uh, uh, so basically the allegation uh, uh, to the allegation that he did not appoint valuers, he was explained that the COC could not, would not approve resolution process costs, which includes the fees of value. The regulation requires the IRP to appoint valuers much before the constitution of the COC. Therefore, the apprehension that COC would not approve the fee of valuers is misplaced. So even if the COC does not approve the fee of the valuers, putting this as an agenda, uh, in every COC meeting till the time it is approved would make good sense maybe for the IP to protect himself as well. So um, there was an order in this case and finally then it kind of finished. So there are, uh, um, so, so let's come to these standards now. I think we have time for them. Uh, so I think in, the, in case we have to before just that to... before that we can take some questions perhaps yes, on the orders that we have received or general and some questions. I that... don't think that there are questions today. Hmm. So I not in otherwise. So there is no question. So we can actually go ahead with our next process quickly. What are the changes which are proposed in the international valuation standard? So the international valuation standard is a structure where you have general standards, then you have asset-based standards. 
and these standards talk about the various processes the various procedures that in that an evaluation professional needs to be needs to conduct to say that the valuation that he has done is compliant with international valuation standards and uh, uh, these are accepted in india in the sense that almost all rvos have adopted these standards as the standards that they want their valuation professional members to comply with so the the present scenario is that there's a discussion paper that they have uh, they have released which talks about what are the proposed changes in the uh, valuation uh, system the consultation on these closes on 28th july 2023 and normally these are then later the finalized and published when they become applicable for uh, uh, from 1st january of the next year so these are periodic periodically revised i think the last revision happened in 2022 so this is the preparation for the revision that they would do from 24 so uh, when we look at the general standards or we may look at the proposed changes we see that the ivsc uh, uh, basically uh, they they enhanced the general standards to mirror the evaluation process to improve users ability to understand and apply ivs then they have included a preamble the preamble was outside the ivs now they have introduced and brought that uh, preamble into the ivs they have introduced this new idea of uh, quality control so that's something that would help uh, the uh, quality control that they have uh, added is basically it checks the valuation processes are performed consistently objectively transparently so there are certain further standards that need to be taken up and uh, the quality control then would apply throughout the valuation process the violation of this security con quality control can now also bring uh, uh, issues to the registered valuers and uh, then of course uh, the the quality control need to be consistently followed and so on and uh, so basically they may perform monitoring procedures so so it's important to have an internal peer review process internal quality control process so that every report that any any company or any valuer is generating should be checked internally and then sent out if a valuer does not possess all the necessary technical skills experience and knowledge to perform all aspects of a valuation it is acceptable for the valuer to seek assistance from the specialist providing this is disclosed in the scope of work so prior to using a specialist the valuer must assess and document the knowledge skill and ability of the specialist so this is the qualification of somebody who is a, a, a specialist and that is a quality that is required now the valuer must have technical skills experience and knowledge to obtain an understanding of the specialist process and findings evaluate the work of the specialist so the you can't now say as a valuer that oh, i appointed a specialist and the whole uh responsibility now lies on the specialist you based on this standard now the valuer who has appointed the specialist would be responsible to review the specialist's work so this is a this is a welcome change brings more accountability to the valuer uh no doubt about that then certain aspects of ivs do not direct or mandate any particular course of action but provide fundamental principles and concepts that must be considered in undertaking a valuation so in applying ivs they have now given a hierarchy where they said that ivs general guidelines should be the first priority ivs asset standard should be the second priority and legal statutory and regulatory or other authoritative requirements can be the third however if said if in if there is a conflict with the ivs then of course uh, you have to document that conflict and say how the standard will uh, kind of become a the, the 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 statutory requirement will become a, will over, will will override the general standards and the asset standards and so on so ivs uh, 10 then talks about um, how the data and inputs has been added to general standards and the set data provides for data and inputs to environmental social governance factors which are esg factors environmental social and governance factors esg is the in thing now and uh, that's a word that is very becoming very popular because of its active usage by the 
uh, various investors in the world where they now say that if you're ESG compliant, then we will invest in you. Otherwise, we will not invest in you. So uh, the ESG appendix has also been included in the IVS 104. So ESG compliance, ESG being talked about here would become then an integral part of all valuation reports based on this change. The valuation models that were earlier there were part of, uh, um, were part of uh, an asset standard. Now they have brought that to a general standard. So a valuation model can be anything. Valuation model can be a model where you are kind of uh, forecasting uh, the values for uh, maybe a power plant, uh, uh, a running business. In other cases where you have a, any other um, any other company or any other asset, there again you can have a very different valuation model which can also be based on market approach and so on. So the valuer may use either a specialist or a service organization to obtain valuation models. So this is all part of uh, the changes. So using a specialist, uh, if uh, the uh, valuer does not have the valuation models, he can source that from a specialist as well. So the valuation model used, the valuation model used must incorporate processes, processes including designing and development, implementation, validation. So I think we all develop a model whenever we're doing any valuation. There's certain changes that have happened or that have been done in the documentation and reporting. That again is part of this process. And then there are certain minor changes in the asset standards um, that are not, uh, again, uh, uh, significant changes. Financial instruments, again, they have taken, made some minor changes. Tangible asset, uh, again, uh, additional content has been added. But now uh, the plant equipment infrastructure um, now includes infrastructure. So infrastructure valuation is something that has also been made part of IVS 300 now. And real property interest, uh, IVS 400. So they have uh, uh, also restructured and aligned it with the general standards to make it uh, more smoother. So uh, IVS 410 is important for any, any valuation where land and building is involved, where uh, a project under development is involved, uh, or a development property is involved. And therefore, here additional sections have been added to provide additional context on data inputs and valuation models. So uh, that's the idea that the, so basically the expected outcome that they have talked about is how the said changes will keep the valuation standards up to date. These are the most, uh, these are one of the most uh, updated valuation standards available uh, across the globe. They keep getting updated um, and it is for all asset classes and it is something which is written in such a manner that is a global, uh, globally acceptable or rather allows acceptance across the globe. But yes, I think in India, we are trying to build standards which are local, which are focused on what, you know, we want from various or what is our expectation with respect to the various valuation numbers that we need in our country. So that's uh, the standards. I think we can take up some questions now. So um, uh, we have a uh, query from uh, uh, Suresh Kumarji. He says draft IVS 2023 does not include normalization process adjustments, which is very required, very much required for valuation process. What is the stand of IVSC? So I believe, Suresh the idea of normalizing or adjusting the uh, the last year of cash flows, I think that's what you're referring to. And then using those normalized cash flows and adjustments for the purpose of the uh, future years is something that is part of the historic analysis, historical analysis that we perform when we're doing DCF. So when we're doing DCF and we are looking at historical data, Sometimes we find abnormalities in historical data and then we choose to ignore those abnormalities and take other years for justifying the projections that we are making. Then there is another level of normalization that happens in the last year of our projections, which we then use for the purpose of calculation of terminal value. So I think these two um, may not find the same nomenclature being used, but uh, these are part of the analysis of historical financial uh, data and then normalizing that would be part of the process. 
No, then, I can read another question, which is, can a evaluation done after commencement of CIRP, let me, can a evaluation done after commencement of CIRP uh, due to delays be considered for the purpose of distribution or only the evaluation done at the time of commencement of CIRP to be considered? <laughs> now, see, as far as the distribution is concerned, uh, the distribution to uh, stakeholders during CIRP, it is the prerogative of the Committee of Creditors. Section 30, subsection 4 was amended and it was said in that, in that section that the Committee of Creditors will uh, distribute the proceeds of the resolution plan and Committee of Creditors may consider the priority of charge and the value of security interest of each stakeholder. So what value, what valuation report is to be considered, how much to be allocated, this is the prerogative of the Committee of Creditors. So which valuation report to be uh, considered, that is also the prerogative of the COC. There is no bar on considering any valuation report, first one or the second one. The second question is in the same person from uh, Ravi, uh, as he, Ravi, who is the CA, CS, and CMA. In case a liquidator decides to have another valuation, will it be as on the date of commencement of liquidation? <clears throat> yes, the valuation should be obtained as on the date of liquidation. Uh, that's what the regulation 35 says. However, regulation, regulation 35 in respect of liquidation regulations is silent on the date of valuation, unlike CRP regulations. So in my opinion, in liquidation, it is not required on liquidation commencement date. It can be a date which is more recent as well. Okay, so it's like uh, it is only to be decided by the liquidator within seven days. Yeah, it is the liquidator is supposed to appoint the valuers within seven days. But if the liquidation, uh, the visit by the valuer or by the valuers, let's say happens after a month of that appointment, then the valuation that can easily be the date of his visit. So therefore, in case the stakeholders decide to get another valuation done during liquidation process, that can be done even after two years of commencement of liquidation. That's what we can conclude. Fresh appointment is not something that Regulation 35 provides for. I'm just saying that the liquidation date need not be the liquidation commencement date. That's it. It can be uh, it can be the date of visit of the valuer. It can be so normally when we do other valuations, the valuation date is the date on which you have visited the premises because that is the date we have inspected the the tangible assets and so on. So that normally makes better sense because the uh, idea that you do a valuation in CRP, let's say. And you do the say, let's say, do you, you do the visit 60th day after the CIRP date? So that, but you're still giving the values as on the CIRP date, assuming that the condition of the assets as you observed was the same on CIRP date, right? That's the assumption that you take. But then I think, Kankit, uh, like in case the SEC says that you, the liquidator now should get another valuation done, so that can be as on a date which is uh, more recent, much later. And that is possible is, as well. That is possible. That is possible. Another question from Ranjan Chakrabarti is, can a, can a liquidator or RP appoint valuer to take inventory of the assets, inventory, land, S&F, and F, like securities and financial assets, or opt for fresh valuation if valuation have been done long before and it is required before going for auction or RFRP? Now, my understanding about the role of the valuer is that the valuers are not supposed to take inventory of the assets. The inventory taking, may it be uh, current stocks, may it be fixed assets, may it be consumables. It is the duty of the RP or the liquidator to do the inventory, make lists of the assets at the site based on the based on the uh, records available physical based on the records available and based on the physical takeover of the asset take care now now even the 
proposed amendment uh, which is open for discussions as per the discussion paper i believe dated 16th of may the ibbi has proposed that the proper documentation would be created by the rp or by the liquidator whatever they have taken custody whatever they have taken control of and just like a panchanama as we use in surface just like a panchanama would be required and along with the signatures of the person who is prepared it and along with two independent witnesses and that particular panchanama kind of a document would be prepared while we take control and custody of the assets of the uh, company so the role of the liquid valuers are not to take the inventory the other question is from sanjeev agarwal if the corporate debtor have different type of assets like financial assets for land and machinery and land and building is two is is two rv to be appointed in each category yes two resolution two registered valuer are supposed to be appointed in three classes one is for land and building the other is for plant and machinery and the third is securities and financial assets two registered valuers for each class has to be appointed again sanjeev agarwal asked in voluntary liquidation in voluntary liquidation if the corporate debtor does not have assets except cash and bank balances and some advances is registered valuer is required to be appointed registered valuers are not required to be appointed only for cash and bank balances cash is to be valued in case it is physically handed over to the liquidator bank has to be verified from the bank statements the only thing that the valuer would be required is valuation of the advances on the recoverability of the advances 531c talks about how a valuation report is compulsory so even if the company does not have any assets on its balance sheet a zero valuation report in my opinion is also required there 531c talks about how the voluntary liquidation application cannot move forward without a rv report no but that's RV where the is question is coming in from without any asset registered valuer has to be appointed because in case it is only cash and bank because in a voluntary liquidation the cd itself prepares a balance sheet and then takes that balance sheet to nclt and says that i want to liquidate voluntarily liquidate myself there are two objectives to the liquidation process one to ascertain if the uh, if the whole company is a solvent entity because if it is not solvent then voluntary liquidation process is not available to that company secondly the values come out based on which then the overall uh, numbers are also available with nclt that what is the kind of stake in the uh, stake in the company or stake involved in the company now the next question is ex exactly for you ankit whether valuation is an art or science <laughs> <laughs> so i think valuation is uh, <laughs> for somebody who practices valuation i think valuation is both art and science it can't be one it is rather more maths than art or science <laughs> now jayendra and gupta also ask whether valuation is more concerned with the perception and uh, than tangible evidences can two valuations be poles apart no perception than tangible evidences as far as this ibb as far as this ibc is concerned the registered valuers are supposed to value the assets based on their physical valuation so the tangible evidences are more important and tangible evidences are also important and when you say perspective or other perceptions perceptions is like say me saying that okay i am looking at valuing an asset and i simply imagine and think acha iski value uh, 10 crore hogi and then i give a value of the 10 crores to the asset but i think i'm not doing that i'm going to the market checking the rates around that property physical property and confirming what rates are available and i'm kind of measuring where, or making sure that i'm i'm giving the value to the right size of land or buildings and all that so there is a process involved more yeah. of a perception when we talk about value value is more of a perception uh, rather than tangible evidence now the tangible evidence is mm. some kind of uh, similar market survey market survey a similar market survey some kind of similar transactions mm -hmm. that may or may not be available in every case 
perception value. perception will be more involved in uh, when you kind of project business performance that can be a perception so in projections in dcf there is a there is a perception that is involved that okay what will be the growth of this business 20% 15% 5% what will the business grow at so that can be perspe- perception perception when you are when you are assessing the value of a stock which is listed on the stock market then you have a perception based on which you might take a decision that oh, the company has given this kind of growth in the past 5 years somebody can have a perception that it will continue to grow that way and the other side somebody can have a perception that the management of the company is not good and they will never allow this company to grow to this level so that's i think more of perception can two valuations be pulled apart i think uh, uh, it happens sometimes and that is the reason there is a uh, provision for appointment of third valuer so the the perceptions can be pulled apart depending upon the uh, assumptions depending upon the uh, understanding of a valuer so the also, next question is also also here also also here the important part is that if there are two uh, 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 two reports and they are very they are giving different values then i think we need to think that as an insolvency professional we need to have we need to go through those reports and understand the reason for the difference now in case the insolvency professional understands the valuation reports and finds the two reports taking very very different assumptions or rather one report taking an assumption which is not even true then he can get that or it's duty of the rp to get that corrected but in case the value differential is primarily because there is a there's a there's a rate or there's a rate of land or a value of land that has been taken by one valuer which is sharply different from the other valuer then you simply ask both the valuers to kind of make sure that they are giving a good basis to both the values and then allow the values to be different if both of them have a different perception so another question is from your team only what is the impact of esg on valuation so esg is uh, uh, the idea that say if i'm valuing a coal based power plant i can say that it has environmental consequences and therefore if those environmental consequences we should understand will not be allowed to run in the long run so there will be certain costs that will be involved when the when the coal plant runs in the long run and i have to then take into those factors to give a value to that plant similarly if there is an industry which is highly polluting industry like maybe dyeing industry dyeing of clothes industry then again i will give that number or put that in perspective when i'm doing esg compliant valuation so i will give a discount because or i will give a disclosure on how the environmental uh, uh, environmental impact of a business or a company what kind of impact does it have on its value similarly when we talk about social factors governance factors we are looking at how the uh, uh, the the uh, what is the kind of social fabric there what is the kind of uh, uh, how how does the social fabric or the social element of a business impact its value so somebody can say that this company has a very very good uh, and very very good talent a very very talented uh, uh, and very very motivated human resource pool and then they they are all having uh, good education they are all having uh, uh, they are having those extra facilities with respect to medical facilities so so these are social uh, implications then governance would involve stability of political stability it governance would then involve uh, what kind of uh, 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 what kind of uh, freedom do people have in the organization to you know think independently so these are esg related factors that are now required to be part of various valuation reports primarily because esg has been adopted by many vcs pes which invest only in esg compliant businesses or many investors today also in the in the western world in the in the us in the europe will only invest in esg compliant funds so the other question is uh, from lakshmi subramaniam and uh, he is asking the valuations about sundry debtors so i understand the valuation of sundry debtor is very very uh, complicated and we also experience this 
Ankit, you can respond on this, like how the valuation of debtors can be taken. The basic question that he's asking, can the valuation of debtors be taken at book value? So when we do valuations for of debtors, uh, the process that we adopt is that we try to first step into the shoes of the RP or the company and understand that what all documents are available with me that I can follow up and get the amounts or get the recovery of the amounts from the other side, from the customer or the, or the client from whom this amount is pending. So for that, anyone would need what? The ledger, the invoices, the purchase orders, if they are available, proof of delivery of goods or services. Then I would need uh, maybe any past document with respect to litigation with the trade receivable in case it's a very old number. And this, and I would of course then rely on maybe aging, that right? how old is this receivable and what kind, what kind of correspondence has happened with this party. Now, many of these things unfortunately are absent in the insolvency process. And sometimes when we see and we give a value to the debtors on the CIP date, some of these debtors which are clearly realizable or, or are already realized by the time we give our valuation report. But on the CIP date, they are still reflecting as a trade receivable. So we certainly give a value to those numbers or to, to those trade receivables that have been received by the efforts of the RP post the CIP date. So we try to give that value. Where the RP is able to make genuine efforts in recovering these trade receivables, then the RP also has the mail trails, the, the confirmations from the, R from the other side, uh, from the clients or from the debtors. Uh, and the ledgers so all these details are normally available and then you kind of put a uh, put a factor in the uh, accuracy of your invoice or you're asking that money for and then you also look at the recoverability or the or the appetite of the client or the customer to give that money to you at several occasions you will we will find that the names that are appearing in the debtor list are only you know uh, uh, only partnership concerns or proprietorship entities which would not have uh, where we cannot do any search with respect to the recoverability from those people but wherever we find companies listed many of those companies are also you know not timely filing their returns they are not active on the uh, on the mca portal so there we discount for the lack of recoverability of those receivables as well but book value I don't think that's the solution. Book value can also be zero where somebody has provided for debtors, a uh, diminution in value of debtors. And there can be an actual value in the debtors even if the value of debtors is reflecting as zero in the balance sheet. And it can be the other, other way also. I think the other question is when a valuer is appointed for liquidation, he should be informed or aware of the CRP values. My no. belief is let it be independent. Yeah. Otherwise, the independence gets lost. My view is that in case that you give you give any value to the valuer, uh, his independence is lost the moment he hears that value. So he should ideally have no valuation as a basis with him. I think the other question Ravi is asking because you said that the in, in the case of voluntary liquidation, the valuation need to be done by the company or the liquidator. Voluntary liquidation, the appointment is done by the uh, company. And then the company or the advocates who are representing the company would normally come to us for this kind of a report. And then the processing, the, then the proceed, uh, then the process goes forward. So MH Trivedi is asking that I was asked to give a quote for the valuation, but the IP refused to divulge any information about the balance sheet, everything. So I think uh, the it is the duty of the RP to provide complete scope of work, what kind of assets are in the land and building, what kind of assets are in plant and machinery and what kind of balance sheet, uh, what kind of assets are there in the uh, SFA. Then only the appropriate valuation quotes can be obtained. Uh, now, so when we, when we see the RFQs these days, we do find a lot of improvement in the, in the, in the, in the documents that are coming, you know, the information that is available in the emails and that really helps. In a few cases where we did our independent inspection of the companies online, uh, we found out that uh, uh, the RP has give, had given a very, very detailed list of what assets he wants to get valued. But then we realized that the this, that this matter was with respect to an, a company which had some retail uh, uh, business. And there we realized that some trademarks were also registered in the name of the company which were missing in the uh, missing in the RFQ document. 
So then when we informed the RP, he then informed all the uh, maybe valuers with respect to that additional information that had come, that had arisen. So independent, I think we as valuers should also need to independently assess the uh, scope of work or the assets which are involved and not completely rely on the mail from the RP. But yes, a well-drafted RFQ would certainly help. How the valuation, just a minute, how the valuation of intangible assets are done? And uh, this is a question from Mahesh, uh, Maheshwari, Mr. Mahesh, Mr. Maheshwari, yeah. I, Maheshwari, maybe, yeah. How so, the valuation of intangible assets are done? It's for you. So it depends that when you talk about intangible assets, what intangible assets are we talking about? Intangible assets can be customer relationships, they can be vendor contracts, they can be uh, uh, they can be trademarks, they can be brand names, they can be websites. So what intangible assets are we talking about and what kind of value are they supposed to add in the overall business that we are doing? Intangible assets which are self-developed will never appear in the balance sheet. And therefore, when you're valuing a going concern company, the uh, going concern entity, and say you're doing a valuation for their fair value, then you look at all those, uh, you, when they, then the value of intangible assets gets included in the going concern valuation. But say when you're doing piecemeal uh, valuation uh, on in liquidation valuation uh, on a piecemeal basis, there we need to understand that what are the realizable intangible assets. So if you tell me that there is a brand for an alcoholic beverage that is registered in the name of the company, that would have a, a value when I'm selling that brand in liquidation. Uh, similarly, any trademark that I have, which would then can can bring me revenue, I can then give a value to that in the liquidation process. So it depends on what is the intangible assets and the method of doing the valuation will vary based on what asset we are talking about. For a brand, one would normally see that what kind of marketing cost can be saved by somebody who uses that brand and tries to market his product with the same brand. I think we need to close it now. It's already yeah. a longer time. So maybe that we uh, we have to conclude. I think the uh, very important part is that the next um, next webinar that we are conducting is the discussion on the discussion paper released by IBBI for amendment of regulations and also for the process of registration and also for the appointment of auditor on the CIRP cost. This would be our next uh, webinar and we are working hard on this for in analyzing and also uh, we would also try to understand if there is any further suggestions which are required to be given to IBBI. So thank you very much participants and uh, uh, keep participating, keep motivating us. Thank you. Thank you everyone, pleasure.